Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our family and friends updates. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Petronella Ndabele, and I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Stakeholder Relations. I'll be guiding you through today's program, but before we proceed, I would like to begin with the land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Meti peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is governed by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the William Street is signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We also acknowledge that we are all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Today, we pay tribute to the ancestors of those of African, indigenous origin and descent. Good afternoon again, and it's great to be here today with all of you. And uh, before we begin our meeting, there are a few housekeeping items to highlight. We ask that you please use the Q&A function to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, on your screen is our agenda coming up shortly. Is, uh, is our agenda, as you can see, it's very packed. And uh, if you are facing any technical difficulties, please ask Atom. Uh, I'm sure Atom has posted his technical has, has posted his details uh, in the chat. Uh, and if you have any issues, please feel free to get in touch with him. Our agenda is packed. You can see we are going to have opening remarks. We are going to have some updates from CPS and we are going to have a fireside chat. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our CEO, Brad Sanders, to give us opening remarks. Thank you. And Brad, over to you. Thank you, Petronella. Um... Wanted to start off just we're we're drawing to a close our 75th anniversary celebrations, um, and it's been fantastic. And I've really appreciated all the people that have shared their stories, shared their stories about uh, uh, community living Toronto directly or their life in the city and what that's like to either live with a disability or be um, affiliated and connected with somebody who may have a disability and whether that's where people live or where they're employed, how they went to school, uh, what it's like to be a parent, what it's like to be uh, in a community um, around the city. And I've loved to get to know those. I think this idea of telling stories has really, certainly for me, felt me feel a lot closer to our community living Toronto family. So I want to thank each of the storytellers who were able to open themselves up and share a bit of uh, detail about their lives and their experiences. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you for participating uh, with us. We're going to talk about some of the things that went really well for us this year. Um, but we rely so much on members of our community uh, that are connected directly with Community Living Toronto, as well as the city uh, more broadly. We've done made a lot of progress in a lot of important areas this year. Uh, and it's been uh, nice to tie that together with our 75th anniversary uh, theme. In addition to things that go well, we've also got some challenges in the sector. And I wanted to share um, uh, one particularly pressing issue that we're feeling both at Community Living Toronto, but also, you know, members of the more than 100 Community Living Ontario members uh, and the 200 Oasis members across the province. Community Living Ontario and Oasis are member-driven organizations that organizations like ours uh, belong to and really represent uh, and talk about the pressures that we're facing as organizations. One of the things that we're approaching the government with this year is uh, the immediate need for what we're calling critical stabilization funding of 5% uh, of each of our budgets uh, to be able to manage pressures that we're all experiencing related to inflation, related to people with changing needs, related to the realities of operating uh, our organizations in a very large province that's got a lot of uh, pressures around how we um, uh, how we hire staff and how we retain people uh, and that. It's not dissimilar to what's happening in other sectors such as uh, PSW world or in the healthcare field. 
and what we've noticed uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half, is that as COVID has drifted away, so is the attention and resource that's come to our sector. Uh, the last significant investment that the province made with uh, community living organizations was a $3 per hour uh, permanent wage enhancement, which went to uh, a number, many of our staff who do uh, direct support roles. It was really needed and appreciated. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, really, really well received by the sector. That was uh, more than a year ago uh, that that happened. And since then, there's our pressures have continued, but the, the funding just hasn't kept up. So we are organizing and participate. We're participating in a campaign that's being organized uh, by some of the sector leading organizations, such as Community Living Ontario and Oasis, uh, to bring to the attention of government the pressures that we're facing as organizations. Our organization this year, Community Living Toronto, is facing a rather significant significant deficit um, that we are working very hard to manage, uh, and it means we are going to have to make some hard choices coming up toward as we go into the next fiscal year. Uh, we are looking to government to help us uh, as uh, uh, to help us manage those pressures. Quite frankly, there is a bit of a myth out there that if you receive government money, that every year you get a couple of percent more to match inflation, and then you have to figure out where to spend it. It's absolutely not the case. Uh, our budgets tend to be static year over year. So what we got last year is what we get this year. There, the last investment in just cost of living increases before the $3 an hour was 2% that came to us in 2018. The last investment was more than sort of 10 years before that. So we are ever, you know, we're managing increasing pressures on a stable, uh, you know, consistent uh, funding allocation that shrinks over time due to inflation and, and other changing needs. So we are developing uh, in cooperation with our partner organizations, materials that we'd love to have you as our members, as you're those of you that are politically active or those that of you who would like to be can share with your elected representatives and really make the case that this is an, an important sector. It's under resourced uh, and we really need government to step up and show their support, uh, both for organizations and also for those that are in receipt of uh, both passport uh, and special services at home funding. More to come on that, but we would really appreciate your questions. And of course, as always, we're open to chat more about some of the direct pressures that we're facing. Thank you for that. And Petronella, I'll turn back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Brad, and for shedding some light on the critical stabilization funding. There is power in numbers, and together I'm sure we can bring more attention uh, to this ask. Thank you so much. I would like now to welcome Heather Dawson, our Director of Quality and Risk, who has interesting insights and results to share from the Family Experience Survey conducted by Community Living Toronto. Over to you, Heather. Great. Thank you, Petronella. Um, so I do, I'm really happy today to share with you results of our family experience survey. And if you just want to move to the next slide, Carla, that would be great. So this survey uh, was a project of the Service Excellence Committee of the board. And that board is, uh, sorry, that committee is the board committee that's responsible for monitoring oversight of quality in CLTO's programs and services. So this year, in order to fulfill the role, uh, we decided that we felt it would be really interesting to um, engage in a, a survey project to get input from families, most specifically to understand experience and expectations related to our mission and strategic goals and our programs and services. So in the spring, we uh, engaged a research company called uh, Forum Research. And we could just go to the next slide. So we engaged Forum Research and they worked with, uh, with us and a committee from CLTO to develop and implement a survey. We reached out in July and August to family members of about 700 people supported uh, in these programs that are listed below. And we heard back from about 152 families. So a number of you may have, uh, uh, may have provided input either through a phone interview or through an online survey. The next set of slides uh, will uh, provide an overview of the very positive results that we received 
uh, you'll see you'll see um, numbers today that are in these gauges. So the percents that are in the gauges, those numbers reflect the percent of people who said they either agreed or strongly agreed to a number of specific statements. And in addition to this, uh, the numerical data, we did get a number of um, comments and ideas and suggestions that um, sort of support these numbers and really give us a sense of what the numbers actually mean. But quite quickly, there's quite a few of them, but it'll give you a sense of, uh, of, of the feedback that we heard. So this first set of questions here specifically asked about um, our strategic goals. And um, so we asked, based on your experience with Community Living Toronto, how much do you uh, agree or disagree with the following statements? And then here, the questions were Community Living Toronto's programs and services create a community where everyone belongs, promote equity, diversity, and inclusion, promote independence, improve health outcomes, are developed with input from families, help move people. Uh, so no the one. next set of questions, uh, if you can go to the next slide. So these uh, questions asked about uh, people's perceptions of our programs and services. So we asked, based on your experience with your family member, how much do you agree or disagree with the following? Programs and services allow people supported to freely express who they are without discrimination. CLTO staff keep people safe. Family trusts that CLTO is meeting the needs of their person supported. The rights of people supported are respected and cultural or religious needs or preferences are discussed and taken into consideration. And again, we're very proud of these very high ratings. Next slide. So similar, we, these questions we asked about, based on your experience, how much do you agree or disagree with the following? People supported have opportunities to engage in a variety of activities outside of their home. People supported can choose how they spend their day. CLTO assists in finding programming in the community if offered or available. CLTO's programs and services are helping people supported achieve their goals and dreams. CLTO adapts programming when the person supported needs change. And the person supported has the opportunity to make important decisions about their future. And the next set of questions. Here we asked about um, a, a, a family's interactions uh, and communications with, with specifically with staff uh, when they're engaging with CLTO. So we asked, um, do people feel discriminated or treated differently because of sexual orientation, religion, racial or cultural background or gender identity? We asked uh, about, um, uh, do you feel that staff are respectful and approachable? We asked if staff are positive, friendly, and helpful. We asked if families feel wel will feel welcomed when they phone or visit the program location. We asked about responsiveness uh, to questions or concerns. And we asked about um, if people, if families feel they're informed of changes in the health and well-being of the person supported. And again, those ratings are very high. And here, the final question is where we have an opportunity to, to drill down and uh, explore a little bit further. And that question was, do you have opportunities to engage with families or others? So we'll be looking into that a little bit further. This next uh, set of slides asked about, do you, do you as a family member or do uh, the, the person uh, supported, uh, your family member or loved one, are you accessing services or information outside of CLTO? And we see here in both cases, the answer is yes, that people are indeed reaching out to other uh, agencies or organizations, either for additional enrichment activities or for um, additional support commonly report, uh, related to a specific uh, condition or need of the person supported. The next slide, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. In this slide, we specifically asked, um, does CLTO meet your expectations or are we exceeding your expectations or are we not meeting your expectations? And here um, about half of the people uh, indicated that yes, you meet our expectations of uh, an agency that provides support to people with intellectual disabilities. 
And we're again proud that for a quarter of, of the people who responded, uh, we're exceeding expectations. Um, and this is through the uh, provision of supports and services related to focusing on in on medical needs or psychological care, um, staff being not only helpful, but available and responsive and informative. And then in terms of not meeting expectations, um, there's comments here around communication and accessibility to programs, uh, which again, area for, for improvement for us to focus on. The next slide uh, shows the results where we asked, I'm gonna go to the next slide, please. Uh, here we just asked this, a generic question, which you often see in surveys, is overall, how satisfied are you with supports and services provided by CLTO? And here, <clears throat> three quarters of people who responded indicated that they were very satisfied. So room for improvement always, but a really nice uh, number there to start with. And the next slide is in terms of what's next. So I, so I, I went through those results very quickly. Uh, I mentioned that we do have verbatim comments that we're taking a much closer look at to really help us drill into what those results uh, mean and um, some areas that we can focus on further. And one area that did, uh, did jump out was around um, opportunities for families to connect uh, and engage with other families or caregivers. So that's, that's the high level summary of our results and happy to share them with you today. We're overall pretty pleased with, with what we're seeing and uh, we will be engaging again in the future in a number of different ways. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm sure you can share your contacts in the chat in case there's someone who wants to reach out to you. And it's humbling to see these positive uh, responses. We thank everyone who participated and those involved in the survey. Thank you so much. Next, I'm pleased to call on Mike Ada and Tom Gasper, Senior Facilitators for Lights to Present on Lights, a program that has been helping and empowering individuals to live independently and create homes they can call their own. Welcome, Mike and Tom, and over to you. Super. Thank you so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Tom Gaspar, and I'm here with my super fantastic colleague, Mike Adair. Hello. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about lights this afternoon, as well as some updates as to what we've been um, doing lately. Uh, next slide, please. So what is lights? Lights is a proactive approach to housing, and we provide facilitation to families who are interested in creating a living arrangement outside the family home. Some eligibility requirements include that the person is interested in moving from the family home into their own home, or over the age of 18 are currently looking for opportunities inside the city of Toronto and that they're eligible for services through Developmental Services Ontario, Toronto region. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> if you're a family who's uh, choosing to collaborate with a lights facilitator, you'd see Tom and myself quite often. But there are several other people who help make up lights and make sure that we're a successful program. So for starters, we have our manager, Laura Starrett, uh, who happens to also be the first facilitator in lights. We have our lights advisory board of uh, 10 or sorry, 11 members. Uh, that includes Brad Saunders, Malcolm Nobbs, and uh, Mary Pat Armstrong, who was the mother who helped create lights. Uh, the board uh, takes on fundraising duties, and they help steer the ship. And uh, since Lights is a partnership with Community Living Toronto, we also rely greatly on our financial services teams, our colleagues in the supported living stream, and many other people working in our uh, corporate services to help us out. Next slide, please. So 2020 obviously brought some unique obstacles to how Lights moves forward. Um, at times, in-person contact was limited, and so we offered virtual facilitation over Zoom and Teams. Even our advisory board uh, shifted to meeting virtually. During that time, facilitation continued, and our families continued to build upon their plans. So nothing really changed other than how we worked together. 
And when possible, we encourage people to continue to meet in places like parks or, or public spaces outside or in small groups when that was allowed. And families continued to meet and uh, we were still able to help actually several people find new homes or create new living situations during this time, which was great. Next slide, please. So we are so excited to be able to host different networking events for the families that are planning with us. Um, and we also provide information at these events as well um, at different locations around the city, um, including our fantastically newly renovated offices and spaces, um, as well as city parks. So for example, here's a photo from one of our um, networking events this past September in High Park. Uh, it was a greatly um, in, uh, attended event um, and the weather, weather was uh, pretty fantastic as well. So these events allow families to connect with one another as well as their family member to perhaps connect with others who are interested in moving into a new home or to just perhaps um, grow their social network. Um, so we are hosting our next event uh, next month on the 12th. Oh, sorry. I think you skipped ahead. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're hosting our next event at our North York um, location December 12th. Um, so if anyone's interested in um, possibly attending, uh, you can reach out. We have some contact information at the end of our presentation. Next slide, please. So fundraising. Fundraising is an extremely important part to lights and what we do because it allows us to plan and support so many families with different goals and visions. Our advisory board, as well as our uh, Community Living Toronto fundraising team work extremely hard to ensure that families are able to put their plans into action. And it's really a team effort and how everything comes together. Here are some examples of some of the events and opportunities that we've hosted in terms of our fundraising events. Um, we have our photo on the right hand side, which is from our revival fundraising event from last year. Um, we're actually going to be hosting um, our, our event for this coming year, this Friday. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we also had a virtual Cooking with Corey event uh, this past fall in which people wanted that wanted to attend could virtually. And we actually had some um, participants with lights cook as well on the video call with everyone. Next slide, please. All right, so over the last year and a half or so, we've spent, uh, we've seen several people actually turn their dream living scenarios into a reality. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Tom, but I think he'd agree. It's been an amazing time to be a lights facilitator this past year and a half. And um, uh, some examples of, of <clears throat> people who've moved out. We had two men who were meeting with lights for three years and they became fast friends. And about a year ago, they found a two bedroom apartment in North York and they still currently share that together. And things are going great for them. Um, we have another situation where there was a woman who's been planning with us for eight years and um, the family continued to connect with us regularly um, over that time. And she's now on track to move into her own one bedroom apartment in her dream neighborhood downtown. We even had some uh, someone leave their apartment recently in order to move into a group home that was offered uh, to them through the DSO. And that left a vacancy in one of our uh, family's apartments, but we were able to introduce that family to a new tenant, um, a person who was also planning through lights. And now not only does one family have a new roommate for their daughter, but we have two other parents who get to see their daughter move into a new home. And when I'm talking about vacancies, um, as time moves on, we're seeing an increase of, of newer homes that families have, have created or new living situations families have created, or uh, past homes from lights, where uh, there, where there's openings now for new residents. And um, so we share these through our email network. And so uh, next slide, please. So if you're interested in uh, uh, joining our email network, you can do that by sending us an email. And uh, if you wanna connect with a lights facilitator, you can also send us an email um, or leave us a voicemail at the number listed there. And if you're not sure if Lights can help you or you're not sure if Lights is a good fit, that's okay. We're still really happy to chat with you. And so just uh, feel free to reach out. And um, 
If you also, if you want to do some research first before you connect, you can visit our website, which is listed there, uh, lights.to, and that has tons of great information on there for you. Thank you, Mike and Tom, for sharing the updates. It's indeed great to see the impact the program is having in the community, which is indeed a good segue into the next part of our program. So thank you so much for the great work you are doing and continue to do. And now I'd like to welcome a very special guest for our fireside chat, Laura Parsonson. Laura has been a part of the Community Living Toronto for over 30 years. She's a proud parent, advocate, and strives to ensure that people with developmental disabilities have a chance to live, learn, work, and play in their local communities. Laura is also currently the Etobicoke Community Council member and representative to the CLTO Board of Directors and been a board member since 2011. Welcome, Laura, and over to you, Brad. Thank you so much for joining us today. Carla, Thank we can you. remove this slide for now. Thank you. Thank you, Petronella. Good to see everybody. And Laura, good to see you. I'm really looking forward to this chat. I know we've done a bit of a... Uh, a pre-chat, and I know it was. Uh, it, I, I, we're in for a good conversation. Thank wanted you. Brad. To, wanted to start with um, learning a little bit more about you. Uh, Petronella talked a little bit about um, your long history with Community Living Toronto, but uh, give it a sense of give us a sense of who you are and what you're all about. Thanks, Brad. Uh, I have down here that Emily's dad and I are both career teachers. Um, and I, in terms of our family, Emily was a long waited for little Bobbitt. We were thrilled to have her, looking forward to having her. Uh, she was born with Down syndrome and quite a few other health problems. And that's how my original connection came to Community Living Toronto. Um, in terms of our um, family, she was uh, well accepted and we were well supported on a lot of levels. But uh, probably the key thing is that uh, nobody else in our peer group had a similar experience. We had nobody. Right. Everybody had great, big, fat, healthy, screaming babies that weren't at sick kids every day. I mean, the first thing I said to my daughter was, you're beautiful. Because by then, I hadn't seen her for a day. They kept her away from me. And kept her, that, that, that was a challenging, that was a challenging well, time for you. So you, 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 you talked about uh, being um, a, a teacher. Yes. Where did you, where did, and, and you're the member rep for Etobicoke. So what, what's your connection with Etobicoke? Where did you teach? We live in Etobicoke and uh, Emily's dad taught for a long time at Smithfield Middle School. Um, mm -hmm. My Etobicoke teaching for 21 years was at Martin Grove Collegiate. So, I mean, we know the walk in terms of, we've all taught, we both taught special ed kids forever. They're everywhere now. Thank God. They're, yeah. you know, they're in the schools. Um, so, so that was, you know, that's, that's neat. So I'm a, I'm an Etobicoke person as well. I grew up in Rexdale and at one of the events that we held, I think at creative village, uh, Emily's dad was there and he knew a bunch of the teachers that taught me when I was a student. So it was kind of cool. And I remember you once had said to me, you were a librarian, right? At some point you became, well, and you funny. asked me if I knew Marna Yates. Do you remember that? No, uh, so, but I you know so she because apparent namarna was a went to martin grove and was an athlete uh pretty well accomplished and you told me that her picture was outside of your library that's true you're reminding so, me of that true that's very true you know six degrees of separation in the end we're so, all for it yeah, yeah yeah so a funny interesting fact is her daughter whose name is amanda uh, is taking the SSW course at George Brown and volunteered. Our, our her placement is with us, uh, oh. and she was at Creative Village and some other. So, so you're right. It is sort of six degrees in a uh, in a small world. Um, so you, you mentioned that Emily, um, when she was born, there were some complications and some challenges. Do you want to talk about what you went, uh, what you experienced there? Sure. Um, you know. Uh. So much of it was negative. I hate to spend, I hate to dwell in the negative space, but I was part of the story. It's part it of the is. story. She was in the hospital for 11 days. She wasn't really healthy. And I was nuts. 
So I was asked by everybody, including the lady that emptied the garbage cans, how old I was. So there's just a nice low level of guilt there all the time about having a baby when you're 31 with Down syndrome. But anyway, um, people who tried really well-intentioned people came into that hospital and kept telling me, you know, don't worry, they come and they get them and they go away on a bus. And I, I said to her dad one day, what is it with the bus? Why does everybody keep talking about they take them away? They take them away on a bus. And, I, and it drove me nuts. And then there was the ever popular, they're all nice, they're all sweet, they're all, what was it? Oh, they love music, whatever. Anyway, so I, I just will have to tell you that I did say to her, first thing I said was, you're so pretty. Second thing I said was, we're going to spend a long time on University Avenue, girl, because my way of dealing with everything is to default to humor. Little did sweet little Emily know that that would be true. And I guess it was because I was comparing her to everybody. All my friends had these great, big, healthy babies. I mean, I, I way past the stage now where I want to push pregnant women under buses. But I had a time there where I looked at pregnant women smoking and drinking. And I think, oh, I never took a grab ball and I was sick for nine months. And this happened. So in terms of our experience compared to others, it was so different and we were law I was lonely her dad went back to work and not that it was easy it was no easier for him but he had a distraction I had this little dependent she couldn't suck she couldn't drink she didn't gain weight she never cried you know it's like to have a baby that doesn't cry it's not a good thing, sign anyway so how did I connect with CLT is your next question probably I didn't know what to do because, A, I was nuts. Like, I was crying all the time. And I am eternally friggin' happy. I mean, it's my my default position in life is that I wake up happy. Pain-free and happy. That used to be true. Anyway, I just took out the phone book. And yeah. I looked up and the that's how you, that's a, you mentioned pain-free and happy. You mentioned that um, you, uh, and I'll let you tell this, but you didn't experience a lot of pain when you were in the hospital. No, I didn't. I had a, I have a nine inch incision from my cesarean section. She was an emergency section after 27 hours of labor. And I never had a minute's worth of pain from that. And every doctor I saw kept saying, How, what do you mean you don't have pain? I, could, I don't know. I, I just don't feel anything. And, I, and my doctor told me, he said, you know what, you have a, you have a broken heart and your heart is, uh, anyway, he said, you know, what it is is, you're way more full and you become every mother knows this if you're out there mothers and I know you are you are so instantly connected to your little baby well whoever they put in your arms and I looked at mine and thought she's gorgeous and I love her and my heart swelled but also my heart broke for her because people kept telling me what she was never going to do she's never gonna she won't she can't she'll never do oh my god it was a lengthy list and including what her personality was going to be like. When they told me she was going to be happy and cheerful, it annoyed me. And I said to her dad, why do they think they can determine her personality on day three? Do they do that with other parents? What the hell? I hope what, she's a nasty little thing. What, what would you suggest to parents or fr friends of parents who um, were, because obviously people said the wrong thing. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that your, your friends and family weren't trying to intentionally hurt your feelings and, and say things that were, uh, obtuse, but they did. Um, what, what would you recommend people? So what would have been helpful for you in that, in going through that? Well, that's interesting because sometimes it's not what they do say. It's the omission of what they don't say. Every right. single person who sees a new baby starts to talk about who they look like. Nobody talked about her looks nobody because it was the elephant in the room nobody right. said she looks just like you nobody not one. and that hurt me I thought uh then the other thing is I had a massive guilt complex about that because uh when I was you end up mourning the loss of the perfect child so you you know and I'm very self-aware I kept inside my head thinking what am I feeling what am I thinking how can I deal with it how can I deal with it and when it occurred to me that I was mourning the loss of the perfect child. I thought, well, what did I want? And I then I realized I wanted tall. And I'd been told for two weeks how short she was going to be. And just so you know, she's four foot 11 and a half. I was told I wanted beautiful. And I knew she was because I kept looking at her every day. <laughs> I kept thinking, she's so pretty. But I also wanted athletic. And I wanted smart. It was really important to me that she was, she was going to be achiever and really, really smart. Now, when I had that awareness, I felt 
shallow. I felt awful. And I had nobody to talk to about that. So what could families do? Like my family was so busy trying to be nice to us because they're lovely and kind. And they were, but they just couldn't relate. I mean, and because I wanted to protect them, I was putting on a brave face and pretending all the time. So I was in like crazy, especially with my mother and my sister. I just felt, oh, I have to just, you know, and my mother kept telling me I had a wellspring of resilience. And she also, she's dead now, but God bless her. She gave me great advice. She said, people say things not from a place of malice. And so I have applied that rule over and over and over again for the last 40 years because they just say dumb things. They don't even know they're dumb. Yeah. Yeah. My neighbor who said to me, a nice neighbor, two doors away, and Emily's about two weeks old. She looked down and she said, oh, they're really cute when they're two. And I looked at her and I said, but she's going to turn three, right? Because I thought, what the hell does that mean? You know? I had the, another thing people do, and this is family and friends. I am trying to get to your question, Brad. No, it's fine. I ask you all the time, people do. How old is she really? Right, right, right. Holy mother of God. So she looks one age, but yeah. people understand so that there's a... F I used to take a long time and say, well, if you mean relating to literacy, she reads at about a grade two level. If you mean sexually, she's been ready to date since she was 12. Uh, whatever if you mean does she come on to men and you know cozy up to them and flirt with everybody including every surgeon she's ever had you know I used to give a long winded sort of funny answer I thought I don't know that's a good that's a great that's a great way of looking at it though is that there's different area dis disability affects different people differently and it's not easy to say well what's the real age that's uh that's a great she answer that and she's Mark. she is sexually she's on she would honestly she is all that but her dad always says to people, she's about 10 because he's not a talker like me. She's about right. 10. And I've heard him. Just end um, the conversation, move on to something else. He, he doesn't want to wallow there. So I tried that recently. I tried because I'm, as you know, Brad, I talk too much. How did that go? I, I tried to be nice and I said, well, I guess you'd say she's about 10. And I thought, let's just move away from this so I don't yeah. come after you with the junk. You know, when the you know what the person said to me, oh, 10 is the perfect age. They're not jaded. They're so nice at 10. And then I did a 180 and I looked back. Well, it and didn't, I, it didn't help, eh? The, no. the 10 year okay. No, I turned and I looked at her and I said, she's 40. She's been 10 for 30 years. Yeah. Think about it. You know, so it didn't work for me. You know, I don't know how they even answer those. Uh, but no. again, I don't think from a place of malice. I'm trying yeah, to yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a good point. People say silly things that are inconsiderate, but not always meaning to do so. No. They just uh, uh, land well, or uh, they don't land well. Um, you, so you 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 talked about you, you've been very involved with uh, Community Living Toronto. You've you've been a volunteer, award award winning volunteer with uh, with the organization, and uh, uh, you know a real. Um, uh, lion advocate. backbone advocate. Well, in in connected with our Etobicoke Council Community Council. What? How did you first get involved with Community Living Toronto? You talked about being in the hospital, not knowing a whole lot, wanting to learn, not knowing where to turn. And give, so Emily's coming up to a milestone uh, birthday, right? Is so, is, is, so yes, this sir. is the, you're, you're, okay? So she, you're going. We're going back a number of decades. So hopefully, things have improved. Um, but what brought you to Community Living Toronto? How did you come across us? When I looked in the phone book, and for those of you under 30, it was the way we used to connect to people. Anyway, um, the, I don't even know who my intake person was. I wish I remembered that person because I know they were kind to me. Somebody on intake, okay, took a lot of information. Somebody connected me to Pilot Parents, which, as you know, is a group of parents who also have children who are developmentally delayed. And then I started going actually we both did we went to some gatherings that they have where parents could connect shout out i have here shout out to the bianis the reeds the zatadas the hill families these are people that at the very beginning we felt a kinship and a fellowship with that we did not have with our friends and our families yeah. And and the idea with pilot parents is that like a pilot in a plane, like they're yes. you're, you're somebody's been is sort right. of been through this and and they're helping and and Colleen posted in the uh, 
chat that you were one of her pilot parents and they I were was. blessed to have you. Yes, I was. And I did that for many, many, many years, but um, for it's different for different families, you know, because some of them, like my daughter are diagnosed instantly, practically. And then others, it's an unraveling, a slow unraveling yeah. milestones, not met. And it's very difficult for those parents because they ha still had all their hopes and dreams flourishing. And as their children don't meet the milestones. So I piloted, I don't know how many, I had binders and binders and binders. I, when I moved, I finally got rid of it all. But, um, and again, it was a powerful time for me. I felt like I was able to help people. So that's a gift to me, a gift from community living, because I had two things from pilot parents. I had kinship of other people in the same situation. And I had the ability to focus some of my energies on something that I felt might be relevant, not necessarily to my kid. I don't know that Emily benefited from me being a pilot parent. If any, probably took time away from her, but it was good for me. So it's a service from for me from community living. So so that you talked about when you you sort of felt guilty and bad and it's almost like you were going through a trauma around realizing what Emily wouldn't be and you felt guilty about that. Is that was that consistent with what you saw with with other parents and what what recommendations or what advice do you have for did you have for parents to uh, um, to uh, to manage that or deal or deal with that. And no. your, your camera just moved as you reached for oh, a Kleenex. So they, sorry. there you go. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, no trouble. Well, my, my, um, my advice to parents would be to get involved. I, re I represented community living Toronto for many years on the special education advisory committee for the yeah. city. SIAC. City of, yeah. SIAC. And, you know, they're legislated to have people. I was there with the Association for Bright Children and Women. I was there with parents of visually impaired people, learning disability, the Autism Society, Easter Seals, the epilepsy. It's a long list. I don't know what the formula is anymore, but when I was on it, and I was on it for many years, I did heavy duty advocating all the time. That's where I met, shout out to Donna Cansfield, who's now oh, yeah. on She's now on our patrons council. She started off as a lowly little board housewife who became a trustee in Etobicoke. She came to us. She, they gave her SEAC because nobody else wanted it. So she came and didn't know anything about anything. And uh, she asked me if I could help her and talk to her. She invited me to her home. We spent three hours talking about community living Toronto and what have you. She's been a stalwart advocate for us for many years. Uh, years later, 20 some years later, I called her one time about a kid in my school who didn't have the right kind of desk and computer who was in the handicap classes. And she, within 24 hours, that kid had everything she needed. Like, wow. so how, yeah, Don, Don has been a great, a great advocate. advocate. And with the SEAC, the special education advisor committees, Tracy O'Regan, we continue to have representation there. And Tracy O'Regan is our our uh, our our current rep and another member of our patrons Absolutely. council, David. She's, yeah, she's Sorry? Staff. yes. Does she have a child with an intellectual disability? Just saying. Yeah, Why yeah, no, it's, we it, have a parent it, in that spot. It's a good. It's a good question. It's yeah. a good question. And David Laposky, another member of our of our patrons council, was chair of the SEAC for a number of years and tried to bring some some uh, important change there because it is a slow moving entity. <laughs> and I think the relevance of it kind of comes in and out. Um, but sorry, I interrupted. You were talking about your experience there and how, how important Donna say, was. And You asked me how people, uh, what would I encourage parents to do? Well, advocate at every cocktail party, join SEAC, become a member of Community Living Toronto, give yeah. Community Living gift certificate or memberships, uh, as gifts to your family members so they get to read everything and know everything and show up at everything and raise some money for god bless angela and sylvia two more shout outs people are desperate to raise money get your families to go to things uh, don't ask for presents always ask for donations for my sister retired from bell and she asked for the all of her retirement money from oh, her nice. to go to community living toronto there's a hundred ways your family and your friends can support you that they don't have to come to meetings. They don't have to join a lot of things, but small bits, they'll bite off, you know? And right. uh, I would just say advocate your brains out, which is so, what I, I'm a yeah, little bit good. less, I'm a less edgy, just so you know, Brad, I can, you know, bees to honey. I'm not such a fool that I'm always so edgy as I can be, 
I try really hard to encourage people to get involved in, I mean, you know, not maybe the way I have. I'm at currently in my eighth year, my three-year term on the board, just saying. It does. <laughs> it just well, you can stay out. up to nine, so don't don't sweat it. We'll, we'll, we're, we're worried about we'll, I know. I'm just we'll, saying uh, that, that's uh, how people can get involved. And it, it, it can be a small thing, like volunteer at your child's school. If you're if you have the hours and the time, I worked half time for many years, and basically I worked half time so that I could volunteer half right. time at my daughter's school, and it ended up being a successful inclusion integration section of her life yeah. because of that. So um, that's that's excellent. That's excellent advice. Thanks for for sharing that. Now, now you talk about, um, uh, or maybe you could just talk a little bit about what. So Emily didn't meet necessarily all the milestones that you had in mind early, but then when you, when you recalibrated and realized what your life was going to be like, Emily's uh, had a lot of successes, right? Uh, do you want to talk about, you know, what, what she's doing now in terms of employment or how that came okay, to be? Okay, employment's another thank you. Big, yeah. big, big thank you to Community Living Toronto. I was somewhere once at a meeting, and again, if you attend meetings or you now you go to things online, you're here. I heard about a new program called Youth to Work, Y2W. It was for 17 to 21 year olds, transitional age youth coming out of the school system. They threw them all out of school at 21. The fact that they learn slowly and they need longer and they need repetition doesn't seem to matter to the Ministry of Education. They just boot them out at 21. Anyway, um, when I heard about that, I phoned in and I talked to, again, don't know who the intake person was. They put her name on a list and she became eligible for it. Um, Shout another shout out. God, I could talk about staff all day. Anne Marie Benetti. God, I love her. Give her a raise. Um, she was Emily's youth to work uh partner. I don't know what you call her, a community living person. She just walked up and down the Queensway. She went into every store and every plaza, cold calls, and found a job for Emily. Before that, she held a circle of support in our home where we invited friends and family, and Emily got to listen to 12 people for two hours, talk about how wonderful she was. Every strength she had, every wonderful attribute she had. That's and it was, it, was the, it was such an empowering night for Emily. I mean, that day, I said to Lauren, if nothing comes of this, if she never gets a job, it'll be a highlight in her life because nobody said what she couldn't do. Everybody there loved her and everybody's, and in the end, it parlayed into Anne Marie, going out and pounding the pavement and getting her job at Winners. By the way, people shop at Winners. They're very supportive of people with intellectual delays. I mean, does my daughter do the work of somebody else? No, but she gets the same pay. They support her. She's been there 21 20. years. Wow. 21 years. They celebrate her every five years and thank her for coming to work. And honestly, there was a time when she wasn't straightening the shoes. She was hiding them in the back room. But she had a support worker. <laughs> she had a support worker for community living. For many years, trying to keep her on track so she can hang on That's to that little job. And the value of work, it is the one thing that outsiders see as valuable. If they right. saw Emily and didn't know what to talk to her about, and they don't, again, not with malice, they just talk don't know what work. to say. They would say, you still at winners? And yeah. then she would say, yes, I am. I've been there so many years. I, 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 have, I have a poster that keeps turning up in my office and it's of the two people you mentioned. I've got Anne, Emily in the foreground and uh, Anne Marie Benetti in the background. Um, uh, I think they're doing something with shoes or stocking shelves, but it, for, so Emily was part of a, a big ad campaign that, uh, that we ran a number of years ago. So I don't know how that poster keeps showing up in my office, but every soon after Emily, Emily is around, that poster seems to take a more prominent place uh, place in in the office. So I'm so, uh, thank, that, I'm so that's thankful great. for community living for that because it's weird how people don't ask her about her volunteer work, and her volunteer work was also supported. It came out of that circle of support. Yeah, for over 15 years, she worked at a seniors' home with support from a. Okay, shout out to Kathy Batchetek. God bless her. She's gone. And shout out to uh, Susan Correa, who was Suzanne Correa, who was also, they were support workers at that uh, senior's home. Suzanne's still here. Yeah. She's still here. Yeah. She's yeah. somewhere else now. But I just, I want to try to think about staff because for so many things relating to Emily, if she didn't have uh, CLT support, she wouldn't have gotten her foot in the door. 
if you understand me. And in our, house, so in our house, service is important. The volunteer work in our house is just as important to us as paid. Right. But it's not to the rest of the dumb world. They all think money's the only thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, we got about a minute or two. Okay. So I wanted to, you. we had a lights presentation earlier. And uh, you shared some news a little while ago that do you want to speak about what's uh, what's next for um, Emily so, and for your yep, family? I will. So we over 10 years ago with the Laura Start, shout out to staff, we tried to connect with light, lights. More recently in the last during COVID, I took every course offered by the housing navigator. The one in our area is Alexandra Shannon. Shout out to her. Took every single free course she offered. I uh, reached out to Frances McNeil, shout out to her. She's a CLT person who's running around the city and drumming up housing for everybody all the time. And, you know, it's, um, I don't know when we connected with Mike and Tom. I can't tell you exactly, but I have notes. I could look it up. And they have really helped us in the last little while. Uh, we I attended, I think, four or five different networking sessions. Emily's dad came to one. And through the um, Lights family, I mean, huh, sorry, Brad, but just to put it in perspective, I was told many, many, many years ago by people older than me, put her on the housing list on her 18th birthday. I did May 4th, 2001. Let me repeat, 22 years ago, I put her on the housing list for a group home or SIL, Supported Independent Living. Right. Still waiting for that call. There's nobody calling because the list is now long and it includes everybody. It includes homeless. Well, and it's based on it's based on crisis, right? Yeah, so, it's, it's a and very it used to be most list. in need. Now it's gotten into crisis. It's yeah. unfortunate. So, so Emily signed up for lights. Is that she signed up for lights? We participated. They helped us. the The guys there helped us network with other families. I mean, we did everything. We we tried really hard. We advertised uh, at community colleges looking for a support worker, a live-in support worker, a friendly housemate. Advertised on Indeed, which is the old Workopolis or the new Workopolis. We, um, uh, Emily took uh, the How to Be a Good Roommate course. I don't know if it was CL2, oh, yeah. Christian Horizons, I can't remember. Um, we advertise on connectability, which and if for you parents out there listening, go to the CLT website and look at connectability and see if you can hook up with other families. Honestly, didn't get too far there, uh, okay. but we tried. Um, we uh, took. So what, 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 what's the plan for her moving? Or the, do you, what do you want to share around what? The plan for, I'll share anything. Um, the plan for her moving, and you asked me earlier about how, why we said we wanted to plan for an awesome, ordinary life for her. I actually stole that phrase. A guy named Eric That's Gall, T-O-L-L, -L, Eric Gall, he he offers courses online, some free, some for pay. There, His company's called Empowering Abilities. Look at it, plan for your loved one, get them to be more independent, learn the skills. Right. But anyway, so did that, spent passport money on it. It helped, but bigger than that was the the uh, all of the help from Mike Adair and Tom Gaspar at Lights currently. Um, I had a couple of people who used to be on the board whose families have benefited from Lights, and they kept encouraging us to 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 try. A look, yeah, yeah. So recently, uh, now back to Mike. It was Mike Adair and he phoned, they offered us something like we also entered all the housing lotteries for the city of Toronto. So we put her on the rent gear to income list. We did it all, but we were getting nowhere. Then comes Mike Adair and Tom Gaspar. And we are the family that they just talked about where one young woman and her caregiver live in a three bedroom apartment and the third bedroom became free. And they thought that the young woman, 32 year old would be a good roommate for our daughter now i of course gave them grief because it's in north york which is geographically unsuitable it's a gu i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to live in north york it means nothing to me and i didn't want emily that we didn't want emily that far away from us but god bless that mike adair he said look he you know he said please listen laura please and i said okay what do you want to say and then he gave me a little drill and he said when this doesn't work out for families it's because of a lack of compatibility. It's not usually finances. It's not usually it's not geography. Geography. 
And he said, so I, the compatibility was key and you were able to find right. that. To and find he, that asked us, he asked us right. to change our order of operations and to really consider this girl that they thought would be a good compatible match family. She is also, well, A, she's short. <laughs> she's short, but she's sweet and lovely and kind. And she has so many things. Okay. Also. Excellent. The, the full-time caregiver is already there, already negotiated and figured out and planned with the other family. So that thing that I was, that third piece of my puzzle that I've worked so hard to find exists in North York. I can't even tell you what a bonus that was. North York is a great part of the city. And wait, <laughs> so Laura, we're, 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 we're out of time. Okay, but good. this has been a fascinating discussion. You are an inspiration, as is Emily um, and Lauren, around what you've, uh, the, the example you've set for all of us. And okay. we, I, when you shared your news about Emily, I think it was at a board meeting, uh, the smile, I mean, you're often smiling, smiling, but the smile on your face, I just felt your joy uh, as you as you shared that news. It was really Really great. I'm going to give you the last word, but it's got to be a sentence because we're tight. So we've been celebrating uh, belonging as part of our 75th anniversary. In a sentence, to wrap things up, what does belonging mean mean to you? I love you, Brad. That's not my sentence. Um, my yeah. sentence would be, hmm, just I, I would think it would have to be something to do, okay, it would be that Emily is going to achieve her. Oh boy, I can use commas and ands and everything. Oh, yeah. Emily is going to achieve her dreams because of the people from Lights who have helped us and community living who have provided us with all kinds of support. And we are going to be able to transition her while we're alive. So she doesn't have to do this. She doesn't have to be wrenched from her home and all that while she's grieving us. We're going to be able to transition slow, slowly, thanks to, in great part to Community Living Toronto, period. That's Done. good. More of a paragraph than a sentence, but uh, but thank you. There's lots of positive comments a, in the chat. A run-on sentence. Yes, 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 yes. If you were a teacher with a red pen like I've got, you would have made, but but fantastic. Thank you. Thanks you're for welcome. sharing in your and your openness uh, for, for everything me. you've done over the years. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for sharing your story. Deeply humbled by your work, volunteer efforts, and we cannot thank you enough. Thanks so much, Brad, for that session. I know we don't have time, so I'm just going to invite our colleague, Joe Pesod, and his team uh, to give us the next updates. Joe and your team, over to you. Great, thanks, Petty. Um, and how did we get set up after, to go after Laura? I, we have to talk, how do you follow that act? Um, thank you, Laura. Um, and thanks, Betty. So I'll present a brief update about CPS. Uh, Melanie will present a feature on our Foster's Clubhouse program, and Derek will cover our respite choices and an update there. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Great. So as you know, our fall sessions have been well underway since October 10th and are scheduled to end December 23rd. Um, all of our CPS program sites are offering a variety of experience at, experiences at various support levels, specifically one to three, one to five, and one to eight ratios. Um, we increased our capacity to serve more people during our summer sessions as we scaled up from being closed for in-person CPS during the pandemic, and we continue to welcome more people back before and during our fall sessions. Um, just a note here, if you are a family member um, who was in a funded space before the pandemic and have not yet registered for in-person or virtual CPS, we wanna hear from you and I'll cover a, a little bit that we'll be doing in terms of initiating outreach uh, to folks just to confirm that. So some feedback we've heard uh, and received so far, our folks are really enjoying the variety of program offerings in the new model uh, the new program offerings we've, we've heard that are enriching and stimulating based on variety and uh, the various activities that we've added to our slate of offerings. Um, some requests for more opportunities to socialize with friends, uh, more time in the program, and more instructor-led courses. Um, therefore, we continue to ga gather feedback and evaluate each 12-week session to see how we can creatively address these requests. 
So next slide, please. So what's to come? Our winter session uh, begins on January 8th and runs until March 30th. As you know, we're running 12 week cycles that are seasonally based. So the program offerings will reflect the seasons. The experience guide is now available and registration will open on December 6th for funded folks. So uh, those are folks coming from family homes, supported independent living, residing in uh, non-CLTO group homes who are in funded spaces. Um, we continue to honor our six hours of support for those who are in our youth to work and community first programs. As we look to reconnect with those folks, we are offering the six hours within the current model. Um, on December 15th, we will open registration for our CLTO supported living folks. And just a quick reminder that our CLTO supported living folks, uh, their base location is their homes and they have the option to register to attend our center-based locations with their staff or access our bookable spaces with their staff to participate in activities of their choice. Uh, as you know, registration is by visiting my Community Hub website. Um, and we will be, as I mentioned earlier, that we wanna hear from those who haven't returned to their funded spaces yet, that we will be reaching out individually to caregivers of each person who has yet to register or attend a summer or fall session to learn about their plans to attend a winter session or any challenges they may be experiencing. So we'll be taking a much more direct, uh, individualized approach in terms of connecting with uh, those folks. So next slide, please. So our fee-for-service options, as you know, Creative Village and Community Junction have a wide array of services that are fee-for-service based. Uh, that is, if you're not in a funded CPS space, uh, please consider registering for these great program options, again, on my community hub. And these options are also open to those who are in funded spaces and would like to enhance or add to their CPS options uh, to access their community. Um, and the new fee-for-service brochure, just so you know, the, it will be available uh, by December 10th um, for the next slate of fee-for-service offerings. And the most recent brochure is always posted on our CLTO CPS webpage. And a note we'll be rolling out hopefully next month or in January, it's finalizing our microsite. So you look for that, it'll be much more user-friendly and easy to navigate site dedicated to CPS and respite. And I'm just gonna hand over now to Mel to cover uh, the feature on Harry Foster's Clubhouse. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to share with you that the Harry Foster's Clubhouse at 20 Spadina reopened in September of 2023. So some of the monthly calendar highlights and events um, that are happening are we have a drop-in for the adult protective program that happens every Monday and Wednesday. And twice a month, which is every other Tuesday, it's the food bank happens for the adult protective program, which we're really excited about continuing. Uh, we also have extra food donations opening up for people in SIL or other food vulnerable populations that need to come in. We do have some additional additional food for that. Uh, every Friday is an open drop-in where bookable space is available for supported living, SIL, Passport, Lights, ISP, or any other programs that are interested, but they must attend with their program staff. And we have large event programs that have happened, that have been happening. Um, for those that are interested, there is a registration and a fee based for event and costs. But some of the examples, um, they've been to the ROM, they were at a Blue Jays game, uh, they attended the Royal Winter Fair, and they also attended the Marley's Hockey game. So some of those events happen not just during the day, but on the weekends as well. Then we also have some small event activities that are open for registration. Um, and we've done some, um, some jamming, some singing, um, some art workshops, and again, fees, small fees, just to cover the costs there. Um, and it doesn't stop there. <laughs> we have some more, we have free activities. So we have a couple of people that are amazingly donating their time to, uh, to come to the clubhouse and offer some free stuff. So we have um, Ki Gong, which is like energy movement, um, which is kind of cool. She comes once a month. Uh, we also have like movie and popcorn, knitting, uh, any of those people that are interested in knitting. And finally, uh, we also have some special guest speakers that, that come in on a regular basis. Um, 
most recently, we're looking at having Arch Law come in to talk about advocacy and rights. Uh, the Toronto Public Library has come in where the local librarian has visited to kind of walk through, you know, how to get a library card and what they offer and supports there. And then we also had uh, someone from the military come in for, on Remembrance Day to kind of share those experiences. So in the month of October, we had 119 visits, um, 42 of those uh, also visited the food bank. And then on our large events, we have an average of about 10 people. So please feel free to stop by and say hi, come in and see the new, new renovated space, um, as well as if you need to have um, more information or you would like a calendar, I'm going to put uh, Edith's email in the chat so you have access to that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mel. Uh, we'll move to the next slide and I'll just finish up here quickly. Just the feature you would have seen me present that we rolled out the mix. And this slide is just a reminder that uh, these events, uh, you'll see the themes there that are occurring at Fairfax, you can register for as well. And we're looking um, to uh, duplicate similar types of social events across our other sites, uh, because we've heard from family uh, folks uh, attending the program that they really want to reconnect with their friends from pre-pandemic and now this new model. So we'll be doing more of these types of events uh, in the other sites. Just going to hand over now to actually the next slide, just a reminder quickly of how to connect with us. We want to hear from you. There's our email and phone uh, number. And uh, Derek, I'll hand off the remaining time to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, my name is Derek Feltz. I'm the program manager for uh, Respite Choices at Community Living Toronto. And I have some exciting news to share and updates. So let's uh, go over to the next slide. There we go. We have just done a <laughs> open house um, of our new Sibley location. Sibley Park View is gonna be home to our first adult uh, respite location that is opening primarily just to serve the respite community and give short breaks to family and caregivers. So in these pictures, you can just kind of see and uh, get an idea of our freshly renovated space. Next uh, slide, please. You'll see myself showing off some of the bedrooms. I am overly proud of yeah. this project because I've invested a lot of time into it, but and we are very much looking forward to getting some people uh, using this space very soon. Next slide as well. And one of my favorite features of this space is we have a large community kitchen space, ability to have uh, teaching and uh, hand over hand support in having uh, a cooking experience, as well as lots of open space for possible events in the future. And what you can't see in this picture is on the other side of the room is an entertainment space as well. Mm. Uh, next slide, please. So for eligibility, we uh, support people who are over the age of 18 mm -hmm. and we are looking uh, to support people with an intellectual disability or a um, uh, ASD, autism spectrum Dis uh, disorder diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, must live with a, a family or guardian in the Toronto area. And that letter of eligibility from uh, Developmental Services Ontario. And if you need that, that number is there. Feel free to take a picture of, uh, of this contact. And we are hoping to roll out respite as soon as possible. We just keep getting those little bits of construction delays that everybody gets during, during those final breaths. Um, so we're really, really hoping that uh, we'll get an update soon enough and we'll be sure to to give you that that information as soon as we get it right here in these webinars or um, uh, check our website. Uh, next slide. And I just want to quickly remind uh, that we also have children's respite. So our Lawson and Enterdale locations are still open and offering respite. And if you have any inquiries, feel free to reach out to us there. And uh, again, eligibility for those programs are children between the ages of 2 to 17 with a uh, diagnosis of uh, ASD or a developmental disability. Next slide, please. And here's the contact uh, for all the team members. So we have an adult respite coordinator. We have a children's respite coordinator. Myself is here 
as well as our two supervisors, Nicole, who leads um, the children's respite program, and Charmaine, who leads the, uh, the adult respite. And for all general inquiries, please feel free to reach out to us at respitechoices at cltoronto.ca. And I think- Thank you so much, Joe, Derek, and Melanie for sharing all those exciting things happening. Congratulations to all the team and everyone involved. Now, without any further ado, it is time to invite Angela Bradley, our Senior Director, Social Enterprise Development and Philanthropy, to share some exciting things that took place two weeks ago. Without any further ado, Angela, over to you. Thank you. And aside from that great big giant job title, I usually just answer, answer to Angela. So <laughs> feel free to just call me that. Anyways, I am thrilled to be able to say, uh, first and foremost, thank you to all of you who are able to attend, donate, sponsor, um, and who have sent any sort of uh, follow-up notes to uh, to any of us who are involved in the event, um, congratulating us. Uh, it takes, it literally takes a village. Um, and I have the pleasure and privilege to be able to just uh, uh, present this today and celebrate it. But please know that there is a cast of thousands in the background that have helped make this amazing event uh, happen. And I wrote down on my notes that uh, the thing I wanted to convey the most is that we partied like it was 2019. And uh, I think that that is probably the best way to, to tell people how this event went down is that it really felt like a, a reunion because we haven't seen each other in so long. We haven't had a, a community rock since 2018. Um, and, you know, we've all been through this uh, horrific uh, pandemic. We're not completely out of it, but uh, it definitely felt like we were back and we were back in full force. Uh, so we had over 1200 people who attended this event. We had over 70 sponsors. Many people donated small and large. We had the most successful 50-50 draw ever uh, in the history of Community Rocks at the event. And we raised the most money we ever had before. We raised over $750,000 uh, gross. So that's before expenses. So soon you'll hear what the net was after we get everything, uh, all the bills paid. Um, and it really was a great celebration of our 75 years of belonging. And, and again, a celebration of being back. Next slide. Again, huge thank you. Uh, there's a great photo in the center here. This is the Dwayne Gretzky band and Ben Mulrooney, who was our host for the night, who I do think may be a replica for Ken in the Barbie movie and maybe can be in a in a subsequent version, but uh, also along with our board president, Val Pache and Brad, there's a great opportunity to snap that photo with the chair of our patrons council and also the honorary chair of the event, Duncan Jackman and Don Roger, who is uh, a senior partner at Tory's law firm, incredible supporter financially, and also a member of our uh, patrons council. And, uh, and of course we were graced by Olivia Chow, the mayor attending the night. And uh, we're just so blessed that she came and stayed quite a while and wandered around and visited and saw the different uh, folks who were there and uh, took the time to chat with anybody who was willing to uh, to pause and uh, shake your hand, give a hug and uh, lots of photos. Next slide. Just some great pictures of everybody having fun. If you haven't been to a Community Rocks before, mark your calendars for 2025. It will be on a Saturday. It will be in and around the middle of November. I think we're looking potentially, I think the 22nd is the Saturday in 2025. So get it in your calendar now. The beautiful thing about this event is that whenever a sponsor comes forward and you see our media wall in the background listing some of our, our high, uh, I think uh, $10,000 and above are, are listed there. Um, when they donate, when they sponsor this event, as with any event in the city, when you do a sponsorship, you get tickets. But in every one of those sponsorship, it sponsorships, it immediately supplies tickets to the people we support and friends and family. And it was really important to us that if, if people in our programs and services wanted to access this event that was a fundraiser designed to raise money for us, it shouldn't be out of reach for them to be able to come and celebrate with us. Uh, and uh, have great seats and not have a responsibility the night of, literally just come and be a part of the community, which is, as uh, we've been talking about so much, our theme of belonging. And I think that everybody who came to this event uh, really felt like they belonged and uh, had some great food, great music, great beach party theme. And uh, I think there's one more slide showing some folks partying it up. Absolutely. With our DJ there and uh it's just a fabulous event. Thank you to everybody who supported us. And uh, we'll see you in 2025. Thank you so much, Angie. I think I need one of those beach balls. Are they still available? There might be a few bouncing around. 
<laughs> thank you so much. And thanks to Angie and team for such a successful event. And we thank everyone who supported us and continue to support us. We did uh, go into mark our calendars for 2021. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters today. It was a pleasure to have you with us and to hear your updates. And a special thank you again to Laura for being here. And thank you for joining us. Our next family and friends update will take place on December 11th. Today's webinar recording will be circulated along with a brief survey. You, we hope that you'll take some time to fill out the survey because we value your feedback. Atom has just shared the link in the chat. Please do take some time to fill the survey. As we look into 2024, we appreciate your, if you share with us your topics, any stories, program updates you would like to hear or see presented, that would really be helpful because we take the feedback uh, the feedback as we plan our 2024 program. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.